up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. Be sure to like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate your guys' support in getting us this far. So please hit that subscribe button. If you guys are so inclined, you could also hit us on that cash app, Unique Access ENT, and help us keep growing so we can keep coming to you guys as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. Now, today I'm very excited. We have the honor and the privilege of being joined by YZ. Thank you for coming through, sir. Man, thanks for having me, brothers. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. Yes. Well, we're very excited that you're here. And uh, we're going to be taking it, you know, throughout your whole career. You got a lot going on, including stuff going on today that I know you're working on. So we're going to get to a lot of all of that. So um, for me, when I first heard of you, it was probably around the 89 era, but it was the YZ G-Rock. I look at it kind of a EP, I guess, because it had three or four songs on it, uh, on the Diversity Records. So actually, I actually put out a record. Uh, I put out a record before that. Okay. But yes. Okay. But let's start where you started. Well, tell me about before, because that's where I first heard of you or came to know who you were or started getting familiar with your music. So what was going on before that? Um, well, prior to that, um, I had did a demo with this guy named Tony D. Everybody knows Tony DePula or Tony D for, you know, his work with me and, and Four Righteous Teachers as well as numerous other Jersey acts. Um, Tony and I produced this, uh, this project, uh, a demo. And uh, that demo made it to the hands of this guy named Woody Wood, who then passed it on to a gentleman by the name of uh, DJ Jeff Mills, who was uh, the DJ for uh, Lady B over at Power 99 in Philadelphia. So it was Woody Wood, the uh, three times dope Woody Wood? Um, DJ Woody Wood, not from ES, you mean from, uh, from three, three times dope? No, no, no. Okay. As a matter of fact, at this particular time, I don't even know if Three Times Dope was even formed yet. Okay. But I was still in high school. Um, uh, and if they were, I didn't know of them. Um, anyway, um, out of Philadelphia, the only MCs that I probably had heard of by this time was probably Schooly D, maybe. Um, I'm trying to remember when I started to listen to Steady B, but because Steady B came out like in the mid, the mid 80s, I think. Yep. Yeah, so I probably heard about Steady B because I remember he was doing some stuff with Karis Mom and stuff. But anyway, so yeah, uh, this demo got to him. Uh, he came to visit me and my father took me to the Dunkin' Donuts to meet him. And uh, I got out the car. My father looked, you know, very, uh, very attentively at the car while I was in this man's car. Cause mind you, I'm probably 16, 17 years old at the time. And when I got in the car, he had the demo in there. He started playing and he was like, hey, I, I like this. And uh, would you be interested in, in recording this again so we could put a record out? And I said, well, I gotta ask my parents and see what they think. And uh, so I got out the car, talked to my dad for a little bit about it. He said, well, you need to ask your mom. <laughs> and so when I asked my mother, she said, a, uh, undoubtedly, no, you cannot do this. And my father pulled her to the side and they talked for a minute and somehow he convinced her to change her mind. And so uh, Tony, myself, um, G-Rock and uh, my DJ at the time who was Tink, we all went to Evergreen Studios in New York and we recorded that demo along with another song that I had wrote for the group called I Am Who I Am. And um, the, the, the demo that I have recorded was a song called I'm Bad. Now remind you, this is a demo that I made before LL Cool J ever made I'm Bad or a demo before Michael Jackson came out with I'm Bad. <laughs> oh, I just have to make a note of that because I don't want people to think that I was stealing LL Cool J's uh, thing and you know as a matter of fact uh, that album actually came later because LL's first album was called uh, Radio. Radio. Yeah, Radio with Rock the Bells and stuff so, 
So anyway, I don't, I don't want to get all into that. So uh, after we recorded the, the record, well, the demo, the, 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 the final demo, man, before I even knew it, Jeff had already pressed up some test pressings. And mind you, he's a DJ for Power 99 in Philadelphia. So now I'm already a hip hop head. So every weekend, because where I lived in New Jersey, you could get all of the New York stations and you could get all of the Philadelphia stations. And there was a station in, uh, in Jersey that we used to listen to called PRB, WPRB in Princeton from the Princeton University where we used to actually go up and rap. And Tony D was a DJ there too. I'm kind of getting off the beaten path, but I'm trying to give you the picture here. All right. So mind you, every weekend, Friday and Saturday from nine to 11, any of those stations would be playing the mix show. And um, at this time, I'm super interested in what Jeff Mills is going to be playing because, uh, you know, he has at any moment he could be playing my, my music. And one day I was uh, I was listening to his show. And I, I must have went blank or something, bro, because I did not hear my song come on. And my brother was like, Hey, ain't that your song playing? And I was just like, oh shit. So I'm running down the street. I run out the house, run down the street to uh, to tell G-Rock who lived in the apartment complex across the street from me that our record was playing. But by the time I got there, he was already blasting a record out his, his window, dancing. He came downstairs, he was dancing. And we were just super excited, man. And at this time, and no one knows it, but in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, I'm about to take on the world right now. You don't even understand. And so after we uh, heard that, we cut a deal with a small label out of Trenton called Rock and Hard Records, just a small independent. Um, I didn't even know these guys, however, either Tony or Jeff, I think it was Jeff who set it up. We, we did, this, comp, we did this, this deal with them for one record. And the next thing you know, every weekend, they're rocking us in, in Philadelphia radio. Now, New York's not playing us right now. Matter of fact, I remember going up to see Red Alert with, our, with that record, going to the Latin quarters and stuff. And he took the record, but he would never play that record, never. And I don't even know if he even listened to it. Red used to give me like hell back in the day. He was cool now. You see me now, he, it's all like, hey. But back then he was just like, man, who the fuck is this kid? I'm, you know, I'm just a kid to him and everybody plays this shit. So what, uh, you know, trying to get in the game and obviously looking up the Red Alert, how did that, did it motivate you? Did it affect you at all? Did you make you? Like, well, going up to the Latin quarters, um, kind of showed me something. Um, it showed me that the, the music scene was really changing. I mean, because in the quarters, man, you would have all kinds of dance crews and cats coming on the stage at three in the morning that you didn't even know was coming on. I mean, out of the blue, like one night it might be ultra magnetic MCs, the next night it might be Karis One. Or it could be anybody, except for if you was probably in a juice crew. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably not. Not gonna get on. It's funny. I'm probably the only person that ever said that out loud, but at least I don't remember any of them being in there. However, I do remember uh, the JAC dancers and the IOU dancers in there, and I believe that School and Scrap were part of one of those dance crews because I could, I would see them in the club all the time. I would see them. I would spot them. Because Kane talked about them so much, so you knew who they were. Right. So we got we got to know them, and G-Rock was an awesome dancer, and still is to this day. So, you know, he would be dancing with the dudes, and I, I try to put my hand in, but I was never really a great... I was a decent dancer, but never a great dancer. I was never really a great break dancer. I was never a great popper or a pop locker, whatever you want to call it. But uh, anyway, so moving back to the record, after we put that record out, 
I knew right then that I wanted to put another record out and I did not want to put it out on Rocky Park Records. I was just like, yo, these guys are probably what, 10 years older than me and they doing it all by themselves. Why can't I do it? That's what my mind was. I was just like, why can't I do it? So I went to Tony and I said, yo, man, we should start a company. He's like, yeah, right. I was like, no, seriously, bro. You're making music. I got a record on the radio right now and people are knowing who we are. Like, let's, let's, we should start a company. And he was like, yeah, I guess we should call it Two Tone. Cause he's, you know, Tony's Italian and I'm, I'm African-American and he's thinking, yeah, we should call it Two Tone, right? I was like, yeah, let's call it Two Tone. <laughs> so we ended up going to City Hall, registering the uh, Two Tone Productions. And that was the start of it for me, for, for, of my business career, you know, as a, a small independent trying to get into this game. And we, uh, we started recording, just demoing and stuff. And in that early times, we demoed in control of things. We demoed uh, thinking of a master plan. We demoed some songs. And I didn't really give a shit what beat he put on. It was just like, whatever you play, I'm gonna rap to that. I'm gonna write to that. So how did you meet Tony D and why did you guys get along so well? Okay. Uh, the scene in, in, in that area, in the East Windsor Heights town, Trenton area, that central New Jersey area, was every weekend, people that rap, people that were break dancers, they would go to this mall called Quaker Bridge Mall on uh, Route 130. Quaker Bridge Mall was between Princeton and Trenton, right? Kind of square in the middle. And every weekend you would get kids from all of the high school areas that would come there. And I would see cats like, um, and if you're from there, if, you, if you're listening, if you're from there, I would, we would be battling cats like uh, Almighty and Force. And uh, who were some of the other crews that would be up in there? Um, Boulevard Mossy and just different, different Trenton groups would be up in there and we would just be battling. And G-Rock, who I was writing for, we would have these routines and we would just go in and, and try to have our hand at battling these people. And um, that's how we got a chance to meet all of these guys from Trenton. And it gave us respect to moving on to Tony D. There was a guy named Duke who had a big, big sound system. Um, very well-known hustler from that area, from Trenton, who would throw these parties periodically um, through the summers and winters for as long as I could remember. And just like we would go up to the Latin quarters, if Duke was throwing a party in Trenton, we would be gone. And I didn't know it at the time, but every time Duke had a party, Tony D was the DJ. He would probably have other DJs too, but Tony D was one of his main resident DJs for all of his parties. And one day I was at the party and I got a tap on my shoulders. Tony had walked from the DJ booth from the back of the DJ booth and tapped me on the shoulders. He was like, why is he? I was like, man, how the fuck you know me? How, how you know my name? He was like, come on, man, you rap. I, yeah, I guess it was his business to just know who was who in the street. And that's probably how Tony started doing a bunch of people's shit. But anyway, that's how we met. And he asked me to come to his house and um, to make that demo. And this was, like I said, I was still in high school. I was probably 11th grade, 12th grade, you know, and uh, we made this demo. And that, and that story that I told you prior to that came, came about. So then what was Diversity Records and how'd you get with them? Okay, like I said, uh, after, uh, after I put out that first record, I didn't want to put out another record on Rock and Hard Records. I wanted to do the shit myself. I didn't know how I was going to do it. I just knew I was going to do it. <laughs> so, uh, just so happened that I, uh, like I said, I got a record that's playing every week on Power 99 radio. So, you know, the area of Trenton is small, you get me? Um, I remember we did a show at this place called the War Memorial. Um, KRS-One, MC Shannon was that, that battle between the, the, the bridge and the Bronx. And we opened up for that show and murdered the place. 
look, and the funny thing is, you know, you can't make this kind of stuff up because these people, I know your fans will listen to this and they'll remember. They'll be like, yeah, I was at that show because I get that now. I remember that show. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this dude, uh, Timothy Baylor, stepped in me one day and he was like, yo, I want you to put a record on my label. I said, well, who, you know, who's on your label? And he's like, I don't have any artists just yet, but you know, you could be the first. And my mind went right into business mode. I was just like, uh, and back in my mind, I'm thinking, look, I got a record on the radio playing every week. This man don't have no artists. I said, look, you want me on this label? I want 50% of the label. At first he thought I was joking. He, he's like, nah, you know, I don't think we get, I said, well then we ain't gonna be able to do no business. A couple of days later, I get a call from him saying, hey, can you come and see me? I wanna talk to you about something. And uh, I went to see him, we talked. I acquired 50% of that label <laughs> and that was just the end of it. And uh, Tony and I were already doing demos and then the next record that we put out was the diversity record. Uh, Thinking of a Master Plan was on the B side and Control of Things was on the A side. And there was one other record. I wanna say it was in the party or it was either- Party, yeah. It was in the, was it in the party? Yeah, yeah in the party. And uh, shortly after we put that record out, New York found out who we were because Marley got a hand, a whole, I don't know how he got the record, but he got it. And I guess he and Magic kind of did their split. And the next thing you know, Marley and, and, uh, and uh, Pete Rock had their show up at WBLS and it was called the In Control Rap Show. Now, mind you, I didn't know anything about this, but I had a song called In Control of Things. So when Marley would start his show for a nice period of time, he would start his show by playing our record. And now Red Alert knows who I am. <laughs> Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of Gangster Rap features exclusive interviews with Ice-T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The History of Gangster Rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip-hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was, I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that, five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always going to be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.